Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today, everybody, no matter where you are in the world. I'm in Phoenix, sunny Phoenix. We're at 7 a.m. And Dr. Bogus is in, did you say Tennessee? Nashville. Yep, Nashville. Tennessee. Nashville, where it's not 7 a.m. What time is it where you are? <laughs> it's not. It's, it's thankfully 9 a.m. Nine. Okay. <laughs> And then all of our friends in New York and across the globe, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, this special mindfulness event is, as you know, with mindfulness scholar and professor, Dr. Tim Bogus. Um, I was just going to share a little bit about how I met Dr. Bogus. Um, last year, I was at AOM. And as a fellow mindfulness person, you know, I try to attend all of the mindfulness events at the Academy of Management. And uh, Tim's presentation was stellar. And I had heard of, of Tim, obviously, in this mindfulness space, as you do. And so I thought, oh, I'll just go kind of up in, and introduce myself and, and share that I enjoyed his presentation. And I just, what struck me about Dr. Vogus was two things. Regard, I mean, aside from the fact that he's a brilliant scholar, but he was so friendly and personable and just charismatic. I thought, okay, well, even back then, like a year ago before doing these presentations, this would be someone, he's a great speaker, this would be someone to interview. And then secondly, just the, the generosity of spirit that he had, he immediately said, oh, you're in the mindfulness space? Yeah, sure, hey, send, send me a paper if you want. And I probably shouldn't advertise that on here because I don't want you to get, you know, 50 pages <laughs> you know, your way. But I thought, well, that's so generous from someone, you know, um, who is a senior scholar in this space and so busy probably, as we all are. So. Anyway, that really, really stuck out to me. And so I've been wanting to have a conversation with you for a while, and this is the perfect platform. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Sophia. And I, the, Venmo, the money will be Venmoed. So thanks for that <laughs> generous introduction. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Although I so, prefer to have the expectations set a little bit lower. I don't want people thinking I'm charismatic. And then if I come off as really boring, they'll be like, geez, I don't know what Sophia was thinking. <laughs> Well, then that'll be on me, I think. Yeah, right. okay. That's right. I'll, be, I'll right. take responsibility for that. That's fair. <laughs> so this event is sponsored by the Inter International Humanistic Management Association Centers Consortium. The consortium brings together global, diverse, and specifically mission-driven business school centers across the globe to advance dignity-based management scholarship and practices by focusing on three areas. Research innovation, number one, teaching excellence, and then global visibility and outreach. So today, for our mindful, as part of our Mindfulness Research Cluster Initiative, which I lead in the center, um, the Research Centers Consortium is hosting a conversation with Dr. Tim Bovis. I'm gonna start with a few questions, and then Dr. Pearson, my colleague, is going to field questions in the chat box. So what we'd like is, um, we definitely encourage everybody to participate, and you can do so by just putting your question in the chat. And then from time to time, I'll ask Michael um, how that chat is looking and we'll, we'll kind of surface a few questions that might, might seem like they are important or align with the conversation. Okay, so before all of that, I'd like to introduce our special guest. This is the formal introduction, not my version. Professor Vogus is the Brownlee O. Curry Junior Professor of Management at the Owen Graduate School of Management at Vanderbilt University nationally recognized for his research on making healthcare, de healthcare delivery safer by reducing medical error. Dr. Vogus was named one of the 50 most influential business professors of 2013. His mindfulness research has received numerous awards, including the Owen Graduate School of Management Research Productivity Award. For his teaching, Dr. Vogus has been recognized for numerous awards as well from both the university and the academy in management. In 2011, he was named one of the top 40 business school professors under 40 by Poets and Quants. So his students think he's charismatic also. And at the Owen Graduate <laughs> School of Management, Professor Vogus is the faculty director of the Leadership Development Program and the deputy director of the First Center, Frist Center for Autism and Innovation, where he is currently undertaking work on the study of autism. Okay. So all of that to say, we are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have you here today. Thank you again so much. Thank you to you, Sophia. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to the International Humanistic Management Association for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Very much looking forward to the conversation. Okay, well, let's, let's get started. So in the, the field of, of mindfulness um, in, within the large field of management, 
there are a few different approaches to mindfulness and lots of different definitions for how scholars approach this important topic. So as a seasoned mindfulness scholar, how would you describe or define mindfulness personally? So when Kathy Sutcliffe, Eric Dane, and I did a big kind of multi-level review of the literature that we published back in 2016 in the Annual Review of Organizational Psychology and Organizational Behavior, we went through those studies that the definition that emerged was pretty straightforward. So it was about attention to present moment. And some of the definitions, although not all, had some aspect of being non-judgmental. And I think that's consistent with more recent definitions like the one I've seen uh, you use, Sophia, about a particular type of awareness that involves noticing what's unfolding in the present moment with intention, curiosity, and that kind of beginner's mind. I think one other thing, and I think I think he's in the audience. Uh, one other uh, piece of work that's I think really important in this domain is Ravi Kudesia's work, especially his Academy of Management review paper that came out in 2019, which talks a lot about metacognition and the mm -hmm. process by which people monitor and, and adjust their information processing. So I think there's some real coherence there about real focus on the present moment, attention to attention, and how we're making sense of unfolding events and approaching things with a little bit more openness and curiosity. Now in my own work, I've tended to do much less at the individual level, which is basically what I'm talking about with those kind of definitions, where it's more of an intra-psychic process. And instead, mm -hmm. uh, most of my work, primarily with uh, Kathy Sutcliffe, but I'll mention some others as we kind of go through, um, it's, we, make, we view it more as interpersonal. So the character and the focus of the interaction people are actually having. So it's about capturing more discriminatory detail about the present moment, right? Like so we're getting a deeper, more nuanced, richer understanding, but that's to really set up more of an action capacity, right? So you can more swiftly intervene when the unexpected happens. I do a lot of this work in the domain, as you mentioned, with healthcare, but in all kinds of reliability seeking type contexts, places where people wanna be safer. So that means uh, detecting and correcting errors and unexpected events. So it's a more behavioral kind of definition. And just, and Sophia, stop me if I'm going on too long, but I was gonna say one additional thing to this uh, about when we think about mindfulness, we tend to talk about it as mindful organizing. And that organizing bit gives a little bit more of that interpersonal, interactive, and a little bit more of behavioral flair. And when we think of it that way, we're really focusing on five types or five aspects of interaction. So being preoccupied with failure, so discussing ways in which things might go wrong, uh, mm -hmm. vulnerabilities in our system, reluctance to simplify interpretation. So it's keeping multiple ideas in play, uh, reconsidering maybe the way in which we go about our everyday activities. It's sensitivity to operations, which is a real grounded, nuanced, integrative understanding of what the state of affairs is, is in, the, in the present moment. And then two other elements, commitment to resilience, so focus on learning from the unexpected and having a kind of openness to that experience and deference to expertise rather than authority. So you defer to the person with the most expertise with the problem at hand and not the highest formal status in the organization. You know, thank you. What, what I find really interesting about your work is that that mindful organizing piece that it's because a lot of mindfulness scholarship, great scholarship is focused on the individual, right? what's happening maybe in here or, and so this relatedness is, is key um, and really unique and makes your work really, I think that's personal opinion, really interesting. So given that your work is concerned with the ways mindfulness makes organizations, um, healthcare and arguably all organizations safer places to work and to be, in the context of the current situation, what role do you see mindfulness playing in organizational research and potentially praxis? That's great. Um, so when Kathy Sutcliffe and I have about uh, mindful organizing, a lot of it's focused on it as kind of the behavioral underpinning of a broader safety culture. So how do you bring that to life? How do you bring a consistent emphasis on safety into everyday practice? Uh, mm -hmm. Brian Hillegas and I kind of built on that work to write a conceptual paper about how do you make mindful organizing habitual? And it's something you bring to your everyday, even mundane interactions in a hospital, maybe it's shift changes, right? Like when you mm. have a patient, 
things like that. Or it could even be in staff meetings or other kinds of meetings we have where we might be just kind of updating each other on what's going on in the unit. How do we bring more attention to the potential for the unexpected to those even everyday kind of interactions? How do we keep mindfulness and mindful organizing top of mind more often? So that's, uh, that's uh, one way we think it's, it's generalizable too. So that's a habit you can build that's relevant for all different types of organizations. The, the reliability that you might be in pursuit of might not be reliability in terms of physical safety, right? Like not mm -hmm. like patients. It could be reliability in terms of effective customer interactions where you're really tailoring service to somebody's unique needs. It can be, uh, you know, any kind of experience you're giving somebody, you know, those kinds of things. So it need not be safety uh, just as such. And we also see, you know, mindfulness is kind of a, a, a way forward, right? It's a way to, how do we see what's next and how do we mobilize quickly when we do? So how can we speed and enlarge learning? How can we learn from a wider range of activities, those close calls and near misses? How can we turn that into you know, changes in behavior or changes in practice? And how can we make sure we're accessing the right expertise when we need to draw on it? So this is all build up to say, I think it's pretty important right now in response to a pandemic. So, and I think unfortunately in the United States, I think we've seen a near complete absence of mindful organizing uh, in many instantiations of the response to COVID-19. So nationally, I think that's it's partly undermined by consistently looking for single, sweeping, kind of almost magical solutions uh, to, you know, even sometimes bordering on the ridiculous with using bleach or things like that, right? Like one-off kinds of solutions, as opposed to what mindful organizing and high reliability gets us focused on is about um, facing things on an ongoing, skillful way. So you're managing the fluctuations, you're really attentive to the operational detail, you're seeing around corners, you're trying to, that's the preoccupation with failure. You're keeping more possibilities in play. It's not fixating on one single thing, oh, that doesn't work, move to the next single thing. It's about getting a more uh, nuanced, sophisticated kind of sense of what's actually going on and it's mobilizing swiftly when things change, right? And marshalling expertise, and that expertise might be people who disagree with you, often it is. So you have to bring that in and you can't just dismiss people out of hand. And it also, mindful organizing, I think, relies on uh, good information, not disinformation, not blame and self-protection. It's all about openness and kind of the reality of the situation that's in front of you. So you need that expertise, you need, and you need to bring it in. And, and I think that's been one of the ways in which the kind of current response has fallen down. There are obviously some exceptions. I think Washington State has done some good things after you know, being one of the early sites uh, to kind of intervene and do a very database kind of way of managing COVID-19. I think obviously New Zealand's gotten some positive attention for doing similar kinds of things, being swift in response. Uh, so I think, there are exceptions to the rule, but I think mindful organizing is relevant, uh, but also uh, been a little bit absent in the current response. I think, I think it also has some relevance if, you know, if the current situation, I think, has also changed in a way because I think all of us are probably uh, thinking quite a bit about what's ha what happened in, has been, happened in Minneapolis over the past few days. And, you know, I think one of the things there about processing things in a more mindful way, I'm reminded of one of my favorite James Baldwin quotes, which is, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing that can be changed, nothing can be changed until it's faced. So you kind of have to face the reality as it is, label it and call it out for what it is, whether it's murder and racism and things like that, and be able to confront those things in a very direct kind of way and think about what are the systems and the processes and the practices that give rise to those. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like I learned a lot just then. <laughs> this is something that you can take at the organ that you look at at the organizational level, but I'm sure the audience found themselves doing what I was doing, thinking, okay, and how can I embody this practice as, a, as an individual, as a person in my life? And so that's the really beautiful, a beautiful thing about this area of study is it's so applicable at so many different levels of organizing. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. That's what keeps me interested in it too. And that's what has led me to some kind of interesting partnership, research partnerships 
over time too, is I, I've started working with people who have more expertise on in the individual level, some that are like Ravi uh, Kudasia has this great study with Yoke and Rev, where they look at kind of a more almost kind of institutional level with the interaction between the regulator and the organization, right? Like, mm -hmm. so there's some really, mm -hmm. so you can scale it up to almost the kind of policy level. So I think there's a lot of uh, possibilities here that we're only scratching the, the surface of as researchers and as practitioners. Great. Well, before we keep scratching it, those itches, <laughs> let's turn to the chat box. Michael, how, how's the chat looking? Oh, there, there are lots of questions coming in. Uh, I, I just want to sort of go step by step. I think uh, Catherine Goldman, Skyla, are you able to unmute and just ask your question uh, br uh, briefly in person? Sure. Hi. Hi. Hi, Michael. Hi, Tim. Good to see see you both. Um, so I am really intrigued by Liz King's attempt to help us as researchers and those of us who are mindfulness practitioners think of this as a wheel of mindfulness. And most of the research has tended to look from one or another perspective. I see her work as helping us think of it both as a professional field, but also as a field in the sense that Otto Scharmer and Peter Senge are really looking at the field and creating a field and then understanding that field and connecting with one another in a field. So I wonder if you are uh, using that in any way in your work. I think sometimes that research from other parts of the globe doesn't affect research in the U.S. as much as it might. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have not been using it directly, but what you're describing, I think, is consistent with what we're trying to do. So this kind of wheel and the interconnectedness and those kinds of ideas, I think, are, are really important and kind of map on to what we were just saying about thinking about it as cross-level phenomenon and things like that and how these things are kind of intimately connected. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot of value. And that's, that's one area that is underdone in terms of, you know, even conceptually, but especially kind of empirically, you know, are, how are we making these kind of connections? So do you, in that context, do you see mindful organizing as being, I mean, I better make a statement, not a question. So I see mindful organizing as being rooted in some sort of personal mindfulness practice. I don't mean that it has to look like, you know, MBSR or Tibetan or anything in particular, but um, in fact, I know that people uh, very, core to this community of humanistic management did some work that showed that, uh, like Erica, I think was the one who came up with it, that having a practice of some sort is key, but that the practice doesn't have to look like anything in particular. Mm -hmm. So most research on individual mindfulness has looked at it only in the context of particular practices. Have you looked at that at all in your research? Yeah, so the one thing, so this is something that I want to do, but I, I haven't seen much good work that's kind of linked the individual practice of, of mindfulness um, what, of, what, from whatever tradition uh, to mindful organizing. So the kind of interventions that we've looked at, and I think I'll talk probably a little bit more about uh, a little bit later, it have been more kind of organizational interventions around specific practices, human resource management practices that influence how people are hired, trained, work is designed, things like that. So those are the kind of interventions that I've focused on and seen, but it's been less about how does that individual practice scale up to a more collective level? Like I don't, I. I don't know of much work that's done that well. I'm, there might be some out there, but I don't, but I don't know. I've been of. looking, I don't either, yeah. so I'm sorry yeah. to hear you don't. Yeah, no, but I think it's, but I think we'll re positively reframe that. That's an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think you're right, and I very much agree with you. I think one thing that we see, so I just uh, finished uh, co-editing this uh, special issue of Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes that'll be coming out in July with Jochen Reb and Tammy Allen. And what we see even in there is there are many different kind of flavors of the mindfulness intervention or the mindfulness practice that people are embracing, but we see positive consequences irrespective of the kind of 
the deep particulars there. So I think you're right that sometimes that some type of practice is helpful. And it reminds me of one of my favorite uh, Carl Weick stories, which is about, you know, playing crashes in the Alps. This, this isn't the one where people eat each other, so don't worry, it's not going to that place. Uh, but they plane crashes in the Alps, right? And people are trying to figure out what to do next. They find a map and they will navigate through the mountains and make their way to safety, but then they realize that the map they had to navigate the Alps was a map of the Pyrenees. So sometimes when you're lost in the middle of a thunderstorm, any old map will do. So that's how I think of your example there, right? Any old map will do, right? Like just start with a deliberate practice and it'll probably take you to a better destination. Yeah, so just, just so that the only work that I know that looks at the importance of this research base that looks at practice as a more general thing is Sandra Waddick and Erica Steckler's work on that. And I don't see people having built on that either and would hope that they do both so that, you know, we, I don't know. I think we've got our work cut out for us. Thank yeah, you so much. No question. Laura, we have, I think, in sort of like uh, the, the follow-up question, Sophia, you want to go with the questions in the chat? Yeah. I, I, would, yeah, I, was, I was checking in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, Lauren Hajar has a question that I think would be nice. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for, um, for having me today. I, um, as you may recall, I, most of my research centers around organizational change and development and specifically the, the impact of relationships, of shared goals, shared knowledge, mutual respect on performance. And so uh, I've been pretty fascinated by your work, and I wonder if you could speak to the interplay between organizational mindfulness and mindful organizing, and sort of, I'm trying to kind of make sense of those two and how they relate to one another and some of the work that I do. Yep. So can, I, I'm going to indulge in a little bit of a funny and mildly embarrassing story to start out, because that comes from, so we wrote this paper, the we being myself and Kathy Sutcliffe in 2012 in the Academy of Management, Learning, and Education that was kind of trying to be a reconciliation of some more organizational oriented measures of, of, of mindfulness. So it started from an embarrassing place. So I read this paper before it had been published, it was accepted but not published yet by uh, Ray Baker and Plowman. And I was like, how could they not even cite our work? I was just really mad and angry. And I was like, how dare they, right? So I wrote this angry screed, sent it to Kathy and she, as she always does, talked me off the ledge and said, let's, let's dial it down about, I don't know, 95%, Tim, and maybe then we'll send it out. And even still, it still had a little too much anger in it. So the review, pro that was one where a review process was really developmental. And they were saying, you know, like, help us. They really helped us to think about it in terms of how do you reconcile these things. Now, that doesn't answer your question at all, Lord. So I'll start to answer the question now. So when I think about organizational mindfulness, that's like, that was what uh, Ray Baker and Plowman were measuring, I think, and we think, uh, was they were measuring things from the perspective of business school deans, right? So the, what they were getting was a real strategic focus and more about environmental scanning about what's going on out in the world and how can we shape strategy in a more mindful way. Now that's important and critical, but I think it's different from mindful organizing, which is more on the ground, it's the translation of that strategic kind of level thinking into the operational everyday practice. So how the theory of strategy meets the practice of the front line. And it's that mindful organizing that are these types of interactions where, um, uh, you know, at the strategy level, it can be more kind of a little more, more conceptual. And you see a parallel dynamic in the, in the research on safety culture, where that leader commitment to safety culture kind of unlocks possibility, but you need, and oftentimes lag, that frontline translation of it. And so that's what, that's the mindful organizing kind of bit of it. Now, uh, subsequent to that paper, Klaus Rierup and I uh, published a piece in 2018 in Strategic Organization called Sweating the Small Stuff, which was about trying to get strategy researchers and people who think about top management teams to start to bridge them even further and to think about those mindful organizing processes as something that might be going on in the boardroom as well. And that, and that top leaders of organizations actually need to do. They need to get out into the field. We have an example from Ikea of a, you know, an executive, I think it was the CEO, like scanning things at the checkout line or things like that, or Paul O'Neill, Every day, first piece of data he would get when he was CEO of Alcoa was, what's safety? You know, was anybody hurt? 
and then he's right on that. That's the first most important thing he deals with on a daily basis. So it's being more immersed in that kind of operational detail in a particular way. So I do think there's a way to kind of bring that mindful organizing even to those higher levels. But when I think about the separation of the two, it's really this organization level, strategy level commitment, and then these kind of ongoing kind of translational to frontline processes. Does that help at all? That's excellent. Yes, that's exactly kind of what we see with relational coordination, right? Is that this, this, you need that commitment from the top leadership to enact that bottom up nuanced kind of um, interaction between people at the front lines. And so I have this hunch that, you know, I wouldn't like to test it um, to look at the relationship very explicitly between relational coordination and, um, and, and organizing, uh, mindful organizing. So thank you. So I think there's a related question uh, of mindful organizing and the measurement uh, of it. Bindu Gupta, you want to just uh, ask the question directly and, and, and add a bit? Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you, Tim. I just want to know how to measure mindful organizing. Is there some questionnaire or is there some qualitative approach to measure it? Yeah, so, so the way we measure it, so Kathy Sutcliffe and I did a kind of measurement validation paper in 2007 in the journal Medical Care, and it's a nine item scale. So it's uh, nine survey items. Each of those items is rated on a one to seven scale. And then for, you know, so the individuals receive a survey with those items, they rate them on one to seven for their unit in some period of time. And then uh, those are aggregated at the unit level. Uh, okay. provided they have the appropriate kind of, you know, intra-class correlations, RWG, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but if you want to follow up with me via email, I'd be happy to send you the paper which has all those items in it and can, can kind of walk you through how we administered it and things like that. The paper does that. So I'd be happy to, I'd be more than happy to share that with you. So it's basically just those, you know, nine items, one to seven scale, uh, and you know, at individual levels, and then those individual levels aggregated up. We've done it at the team level, we've done it at the unit level, uh, less so at the kind of big organizational level, uh, which you know, those, those kind of measures tend to break down, uh, especially in healthcare settings where hospitals, there's not as much coherence at the hospital level as one would hope. Uh, there's a lot of coherence though at the unit levels, like the intensive care unit or the emergency department or things like that. Thanks, thanks a lot. So I will look forward for your paper. So I will send your mail to request for the paper. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Happy to Thank share. You. Thank you. Michael, let's take one more question from the chat. Um, yeah, okay, let's uh, I'll go to Sherazad uh, Bedaina. I think there are many people that are wondering about the normative content of mindfulness. And uh, I think the critique that's coming in in terms of Mac mindfulness, et cetera, is sort of built on that. Uh, Sherazad, are you able to? Ask directly. Uh, hello, nice to meet you all. I'm uh, just I want to say uh, I'm not a native English speaker, so uh, I I think um, no. I'm curious about if uh, mindfulness and leadership rely on some predefined core values, or uh, like uh, or have an ethical or pragmatic approach. Like how to scale the Korean situation uh, or the, and the progress? Do I have the same question? Uh, like, is it the same question like uh, the one who asked before? I don't think so. No, I think that's I think that's a distinct question for sure. It's a and it's a really Thank important. Thank you very much. Uh, because you know what we know less about. So what I what I've studied primarily with Kathy with others is you know we what is your present level of mindful organizing in a unit and how does it explain various outcomes? How is it associated with specific kind of organizational practices? What we know less about at the organizational level is what is the kind of normative bent of a leader that leads to the adoption and pursuit of this way of interacting, of, of role modeling, of cascading a set of behaviors through the organization. So what kind of fuels the adoption of that? And that, there, there have been a couple, like, there are a couple examples. So there's one, it's, uh, I think it's uh, Gallagher, Byerly, and Spender have a paper in Industrial and Corporate Change about the United States nuclear submarine fleet. So that might not be an obvious place you would look for. That's certainly not where like Purser and Melillo and those folks would look for good examples of kind of 
proper normative practice. Um, you know, but what you see there is an example of a leader, Admiral Rickover, who kind of created the space for more mindfulness and re high reliability to be elevated as a value. Uh, Carl Weick has a nice piece in terms of, uh, that's a conceptual piece in 2006, it's in this, uh, I'm gonna forget the edited book, but I think it's Kim Cameron and Edward Hess have an edited book from 2006, and Weick talks about kind of the values component of mindful organizing. So when I think you see it in the world of practice, I think the Paul O'Neill example I gave a little bit earlier is relevant for that, where it's about mm -hmm. what do I believe in? I believe in the dignity of the frontline workforce. I believe in the safety of the frontline workforce. So that's some of what animates the pursuit of this high reliability. You know, these are, there are some things that we just cannot, will not and cannot allow to happen. And we're not going to trade off for other priorities like profitability or whatever, right? We're not gonna trade off people's safety and dignity and respect for them uh, for those other things. Thank you very much. That really answers but it, but my question. But it's a worthwhile, if you're pursuing research in this, I mean, that's a worthwhile thing to go after is why do organizations adopt it? And why do they adopt it differentially and things like that? But that that's an interesting question. I wanna pivot slightly and ask you maybe a, a more personal question. So thinking back on your uh, long and inspiring scholarly career, what has been your favorite research project to date? Yeah, my, my long, thanks for making me feel old, Sophia. I'm not that <laughs> <You're> old. <welcome. laughs> although although that, that 40 under 40, that happened, that's a bit in the rear view mirror, unfortunately. Uh, so it's a hard question to answer because I always try to work, you know, on two levels, because I always really try to work with my favorite people as you know my favorite scholars my favorite humans and on topics that i think really matter and that's something that you know uh, kathy sutcliffe really instilled in me and quite honestly my parents really instilled in me is like go after the big questions you care about so i love them all uh so that's a, that's that's a cop-out but i'll give you a, i'll give you another answer i think that my favorite research project or favorite paper is one that was uh, with Don Yakabuchi, who's a marketing professor and just a legendary methodologist in terms of structural equation modeling and things like that at, at Vanderbilt. And what I loved about that project was the process. I loved working with Don and learning from her. It's in a journal that I've always really valued. So what motivated me to get into this field in the first place was a real passion for industrial relations and things like that. So we published that in Industrial and Labor Relations Review, which is a, a journal that I just really value. And it was part of a special issue on healthcare that, that was uh, done by some of my favorite scholars and people, Ariel Avgar, Adam Seth Litwin, Becky Given, and Adrienne Eaton, who are just you know, top flight scholars and just great humans. Uh, and it really was a completion of what animated me to go to graduate school, the question I wanted to answer. And that question I wanted to answer was about, we know things about human resource management practices, high performance work systems, and, and that they are associated with better outcomes, right? Like performance outcomes of all the varieties. But the how, at the time I was, you know, really initially trying to answer this was a little bit more mysterious. You know, what's the mechanism between these work practices and these, and these outcomes? Um, so what's in that specific study is we look at what we end up calling reliability enhancing work practices or reliability enhanced, try to say that fast, uh, reliability enhancing work practice system, you know, kind of system of those practices, a bundle of those practices, and it's about selection. So you're selecting people for technical as well as interpersonal skills, right? Like, so you're balancing that out so people know how to work together and can engage in these more mindful interactions where you're training people to get in conflict management and better interactions. And then you're designing the work so they actually have voice and input in the decision-making that goes into the everyday practice. So it's that bundle of work practices. And what we find is that elicits um, more respectful interactions, so interactions that are characterized by trust, honesty, self, and mutual respect. And it's those micro interactions that, that are associated with the more mindful organizing. And we find some, some, find some strong effects related to fewer medication errors, fewer patient falls. And we also find a direct effect of those reliability enhancing practices on fewer medication errors and fewer patient falls. One other uh, interesting thing that happens in that paper that's not really directly about mindfulness, but we also looked at organizational citizenship behavior. 
So just the extent to which people are going above and beyond the call of duty, engaging in discretionary effort. And what we find with that is that's actually associated with higher levels of medication errors and higher levels of patient falls. So the more kind of channeled focus, mindful mm -hmm. attention and practice is helpful, the more kind of generalized uh, organizational citizenship behavior, less so. And I, I and we were surprised by that finding. And so we spent a good amount of time talking as we did that study in hospital nursing units, talking to nurses on the front line. Here's what we found. What do you think? Does this make any sense to you? And they're like, yep. It's all those people that go work the double shift back to back, that go above and beyond the call of duty, that work outside their scope of practice, and those people are dangerous. Or it's broken systems necessitate all kinds of discretionary effort and workarounds and all kinds of operational failures, which makes the system more dangerous in the first place. So uh, anyway, so that, and that paper is also a favorite because it took an embarrassingly long time to publish. Uh, I mean, almost comically long. I won't, I will not disclose how long. You won't? Okay. I will, I will not. All of our it was, it, students and it, junior it, faculty. It didn't, it, didn't, it didn't graduate from high school, but boy, uh, it was, <laughs> definitely graduated from elementary school. Uh, <laughs> so, so it took a while. It took a while. It, it is good. Thank you for sharing. It, it's really good for people. I, um, you know, we have a variety of different scholars on these calls, but we have a lot of postdocs, PhD students, junior faculty, and people who, who look for scholarly advice and insight and, and wisdom. And so sharing things like that is, um, is really helpful. All right. Well, if, that, if that's welcome, I'll, I'll add a piece. The, the best advice I ever got was to start working with people with whom I enjoyed working, but also were at a similar career stage. So when I start, when I was like a more, a little bit, slightly more seasoned assistant professor, I started doing that and my productivity took off because there was the mm -hmm. alignment of, we like the topics, we know enough to be dangerous and to be able to actually get submissions through and maybe occasionally get them published, but we're all really motivated to make that happen. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was really helpful advice because I think oftentimes we all think about, oh, I want to work with the biggest name in the field. And that's, yeah. kinda, that's not necessarily the right way to go about it because those people might be spread really thin, might not be able to get the project enough attention, and it might sit dormant for longer than it, than it might otherwise. So getting people who are aligned in that kind of way. And if you look at my career trajectory, I mean, there was a, there was a three year period where I had nothing hit zippo uh so uh so if you if you've had some lulls in in your own career i i share i share that experience it's not a fun experience people really uh you know those those annual reports well the only thing good about them is they're quick to write because there's not much to report on. uh but uh but uh people uh lose a little bit of faith in you but don't lose faith in yourself because i i know many people who have had those kind of you know, significant gaps and are able to navigate through. And sometimes it's just about finding the right people to help you get over the hump on a couple projects. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Sure. Michael, how's the chat look? Uh, I'm good. It's, there are lots of questions. I'm going to try to, to fail at summarizing them. But um, there are a number of questions in terms of how, the, in, in terms of the practice, can organizations become more mindful? Some people would say, is, is mindful organizing not a standard? So is it a focus, focal uh, question, like what do you focus on? And then a strategic question. But then the other part is sort of like, what is the downside of mindfulness and potentially make mindfulness that criticism? Where, where do you position that in and, and how would you react to that? Um, That's great. Uh, I, so in terms of how do you, you know, what are the interventions that can bring it about at an organizational level? I think the science on that is really limited. So I would say, you know, even though I have, you know, kind of multi-source data in that industrial and labor relations review paper where we link organizational practices to these processes to outcomes at a later point in time and we can control for prior outcomes, blah, blah, blah. It's still not a clean kind of we intervened by changing these practices in order to elicit more mindful organizing it followed and then we know it's completely a clean causal story here. so i don't know that there's work that does that all that precisely there's mm -hmm. some work uh, that i'm doing with uh with ravi uh, kadesia chris reyna yoke and rev david layman and i'm leaving i know i'm leaving 
studies and people often have messed on that paper. Uh, but where we kind of pooled together a set of studies that some are experimental and it starts to get around that a little bit more about the types of interventions and the types of different settings in which um, you know, mindfulness might elicit these outcomes. But I think you know, the kind of human resource practices that I'm talking about, I think leadership behaviors that are consistent with those, right? Like making the organization more inclusive, right? Where leaders are role modeling the right kind of behaviors around that are emphasizing mindfulness and things like that help. But we need more work uh, to say that more definitively. In terms of the limitations of mindfulness or the downside of it, um, you know, one thing that's interesting is the McMindfulness folks, uh, so Purser and Melillo, they have a paper that was published, I think it was 2015 in Journal of Management Inquiry, where they kind of develop a, a model that they believe is more co connected to the kind of, you know, the emancipatory soteriological purpose of mindfulness, that kind of liber liberation kind of component of it. But when you look at that model, it doesn't look qualitatively different than like what's going on with mindful organizing. So I think there is some consistency. There's a, just a difference in focus and a difference in purpose, but the processes I think are malleable to the, pursue those different purposes. In fact, the first study, the very first study I did where I only had a very indirect and in, imperfect kind of assessment of that mindfulness was going on was in the software industry, right? Like, and so in this, uh, initial public offering software firms and some of these kind of more reliability centered kind of things seem to be associated with higher levels of innovation and things like that. Um, so you can have different purposes. So I think the nice thing about mindful organizing is it's kind of a roomy framework that can accommodate a lot. Where I've seen unexpected findings, and, and in some ways I think this is one of the more exciting findings that's in our work, is a paper I did with uh, Bruce Coyle, uh, who's a statistician at, at Vanderbilt, Mary Sitterding, who's a, a nurse, and Linda Everett, who's also a nurse, but they're nurse scholars. Um, and you know, I would guess that most people on this, this, this paper is undersighted in my, in my opinion, <laughs> but I think it's cool. Uh, so I'll tell you why I think it's cool, because I think it's some of this unexpected and some of the downside of it. So that we had a pretty diverse team as I described, and I think it answers an important question. And the question is, what are the personal consequences of mindful organizing? You know, because we talk about it mostly as we're going to team process, collective process, and how it affects these outcomes. But it also sounds like really hard work. Paul Shulman puts it great in his classic 1993 paper about the uh, Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor, where it's people are, are working beyond, you know, the psychological and emotional equilibrium to engage in sustained high reliability and mindful organizing kind of work, right? So, you know, people are operating behind the limit. That can potentially be pretty exhausting. And that's what we looked at. And we thought, well, but yeah, but mindful organizing could be a resource against that too. And so what we found was no main effect of mindful organizing at the collective level on individual experience of emotional exhaustion. But what we did find was an interesting interaction effect. So in, in nursing units where there were high levels of errors, you know, lots of stuff going wrong, higher levels of mindful organizing were associated with lower levels of emotional exhaustion. So it was a resource when it felt like it was worth the investment. When people mm -hmm. said, oh, if I, we engage in mindful organizing and put in all this extra work, we'll work beyond our psychological equilibrium. Well, there's some value in doing that because it's gonna help us fix this chaotic situation, these errors, right? Uh, but what we also found was that in units that were, had very few errors, high levels of mindful organizing was associated with higher levels of emotional exhaustion. So when you're, you know, and that's one of the tricky bits about safety, right? Like Carl White talks about it as a, a dynamic non-event, right? Like that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to create, make sure that nothing happens. That doesn't feel as rewarding as fixing problems, right? So if you're trying to make nothing happen over and over again, boy, I'm really successful at making sure nothing happens. Uh, you know, that can feel exhausting. So what do people need? Reminders of nothing happening means patients got high quality care, right? Like bringing patients back, tell the patient stories. Oh boy, you, the care I got here made all the difference in my life. Look at my family so much happier, blah, blah, blah. Things like that. Things that are kind of reminders and reinfusions of the meaning. So it's that interaction effect that it's a little bit more nuanced 
with what's the personal experience and the benefits and the costs of my ongoing mindful organizing for the people who are doing it. And that's, I think, some of where the McMindfulness folks are getting at is that it can be exploitative or, you know, that you're going to go mind, be mindful and fix yourself. And that's also why I think in our work, we try to focus on the interpersonal and the behavioral is it's, you know, it's something we're doing together and we're actually helping solve problems for each other. Um, you know, in that work with that, those unexpected findings with uh, emotional exhaustion, we also did find that over time, higher levels of mindful organizing was associated with lower levels of turnover. Presuming that over time, you're going to be able to fix more things that even if, you know, even for units that have zero for a long time, there's probably going to be over time some bad things that happen and that mindfulness is worthwhile. And if I'm able to practice that way, less likely to turn over. And that really led me to do a lot more work with emotion and mindful organizing. And so it's really, that was kind of my entryway into a longstanding and now several paper collaboration with Laura McClelland with work on compassion and compassion practices and organization and trying to bring the mindful organizing and the compassionate together and saying, seeing how they're important. And I also work with uh, Naomi Rothman on emotional ambivalence and its role in kind of sustaining um, mindful, mindfulness at, at work. Sorry, that was a long answer to, to a relatively short question. <laughs> there is a, a follow-up or something that goes maybe a little bit deeper here. Melissa Mejia, are you there to ask your questions or maybe reframe it given the, the answer that Tim was already presenting? Melissa? Uh, yeah, I am. Um, well, I don't know if it's still uh, important to do it now because you were also talking about it um, recently, but I was asking, wait, because I wrote it, so I don't forget, <laughs> what did I ask? But um, I'm, I'm working as a communicator now, so I have to do a lot of um, proposals for um, engagement, also for management. So I was asking if how to present it also in a way to understanding this proposal in, in, in terms of caring you now rather, rather than control. Because recently, um, all the strategies that impact like a lot of the individual, you know, the, the lifestyle, our lifestyle or our daily life can also become very invasive you now. So, uh, if our idea is to build, to connect, to engage, to co-create with others, um, this can also be understood differently. And I say this because, for example, my tests are my parents. <laughs> so when I ask them if this works for them, they say, no, I'm so tired. I don't want to, I don't want to say how, how I am, how, I, how, how do I feel. I just want to do my work and, and, and that's all, no? And also because in this period, we have to check if, if we are online, if we're not online, if we already did this thing or not. So it's very controlling right now. So they are not feeling very engaged with the um, strategies that their uh, companies are using. So for me, it's also the same question. I'm, I'm using uh, some strategies that are, are helpful to connect with people but maybe this cannot be understood very well from, from all people. Yeah, so that, that, I like the way you articulated that around the, the care versus control, because I think there is a real risk with these kind of mindfulness approaches, anything around safety, that it just, that it either gets traded off when it's get against a more acute goal of production or something like that, we gotta go back to control, or I can't care too much, right, because I've got to, got to keep those boundaries and police those kind of things. Um, but, I, but I think your point's really well taken about a, a care orientation. And, it, and you're right, it does link to why my work, and as I collaborated with Laura and others, has started to move more in a compassion kind of direction, which is how do, you, how, how do you deliver this in a more caring kind of way? And one of the things that we find in our work on compassion practices is about the importance of creating forums for processing workplace trauma. 
Hmm. And sometimes those are talked about in healthcare as so-called Schwartz rounds, where people, it's not, a, it's not like we're trying to fix the problem that occurred. That's you know, a different kind of rounding. Uh, but what we're trying to deal with is the kind of emotional trauma and fallout of what's been experienced and helping people work through that. So they feel cared for in a more kind of holistic way. And they see others as potential helpers and we're all sharing and we're all working through it together. So I think things like that can be helpful. Um, another example related to that would be um, they have something called Code Lavender, which is at the Cleveland Clinic. And co so the codes are, you know, a patient crashes and everybody kind of rushes in a rapid response team to help stabilize that patient. What they do with these Code Lavenders is somebody emotionally crashes, either experiences the loss of a patient, some of the workplace trauma, and they need help. So they have a kind of a rapid response team of chaplains and others that intervene to help you know, deliver the caring to the point of need in real time at work. And then, you know, people on the, on the unit know that this has happened. They know that somebody might need a little bit of extra support. They use these kind of armbands and other kinds of things. And it's a, it's a widely used practice. So I think there are kinds of interventions that can be done in ways that help support the ongoing mindfulness and, and do it in a, in a less controlling kind of way, as a way to exploit or to get, you know, 10% uh, more productivity from all employees, right, or things like that, where it's a more authentic, other-oriented type of interaction. And I hope that, I hope that answers the question. Tim, one of the things that your work seems to do um, that I think is important to a lot of people on this call is it grounds sort of humanistic, you know, potentially normative, um, maybe some would say moral, not necessarily, I don't know if you would say that, but it grounds some of these human-centered concepts in the, the field of management in a way that is palatable to potentially a wider audience than just people who would show up at a humanistic management call. So I think that's a really important thing to do in order to make the work that a lot of us are interested in um, relevant and meaningful to the folks that are outside of our person, our smaller sphere of influence. So what advice would you have for scholars who are interested in pursuing work similar to the work that you do, um, but also are concerned about making sure that work is uh, accepted and, and relevant to management writ large? Yeah, so the thing that I've had to learn over and over and over again uh, is to really listen to the people you want to work with or you want to study. And what are the problems that are the biggest nuisance for them that get in the way? Because a lot of the things that this organization and all its members are offering, and a lot of, I think, what Mindful Organizing Compassion, what it offers is just a way to help people navigate through some of the most persistent and difficult problems they face in the workplace, right? Like ways that can enhance workplace effectiveness and meaning and all those things kind of simultaneously. So, it's a, so when I've been successful doing any kind of interventions, it's been because mindful organizing was something that was intimately tied to something that was a problem that needed solving something that needed help in addressing in the local context. Not, and when it hasn't worked as well, people really loved the language of it. Like, ooh, I'm, I'm preoccupied with failure, you know, because a lot of healthcare organizations, people like fancy lingo, uh, and it's a lot of heavy lingo. Um, so, with, but if it's not tied to anything that's much more, uh, much more local and micro, it's, it's, it's not making much of an impact. So I think when, when, and even how you language it, like I started out, you know, trying to do interventions around safety. And when you start to label things around safety, people put it in a certain kind of box and people, other people are resistant to it. Safety, I'm safe. It's those other knuckleheads that I work with that don't get it and mess up all the time. Those other doctors are terrible. I have never made an error in my entire career. You know, uh, so it gets people in a defensive crouch. When you talk about reliability, you put it out there as a system problem. And mm. This is just a way to give you uh, help navigate that and to help get others working in a way that's kind of helpful to you and the purpose and what you want to deliver. Mm. So I think tying it in those kind of ways has been what's been most helpful for me in terms of generalizing it out. And it's something that I've, I'm constantly having to work on. You know, so like that paper Klaus Rerup and I wrote, you know, just a couple years ago, 
that took a long time for us to think through. We just realized we're not getting any traction with any of the strategy folks at all. Why not? What are we missing? Oh, we're not part of that conversation. Here's why not. Let's try to be part of that conversation. How can that apply? So it's the same kind of principle. It's just a research community instead of a practice community, right? Like what's the problem we might help solve uh, with this concept, with these set of ideas? Great, thank you. And then Ken, Ken Nishikawa, you have a question that seems interesting. Yes, hi, this is Ken. Uh, I'm in Japan, so I mean, uh, uh, almost all midnight, so hi. <laughs> uh, here's my question about uh, uh, a cultural, international cultural uh, point of view. So, so mindful organizing is an interesting idea for for Japanese uh, context. But also at the same time, I'm so curious about the idea. So when I apply uh, the mindful organizing a concept into Japanese context. So, as you know, so people love to uh, don't do wanna take uh, any uh, uncertainty, and so it's a famous uh, Hofstede cultural uh, research shows uh, Japanese love to take position of uncertainty avoidance. So. Also, so uh, macho culture uh, dominated the industrial organization, mm -hmm. and so in that context, uh, how degree uh, do you think so mindful organizing so have a uh, applicability in, in in international context, but mostly in Asia, East Asian uh, context like uh, China and uh, South Korea and uh, Taiwan and uh, Hong Kong. So could you tell me about uh, your idea? Yeah, I think I, I think it's a great question, and I think there is the the work that I know is underrepresented in those contexts, right? Like you don't see as I haven't seen as much of it there, but I think it's you know highly applicable, and you even see it, you know, obviously like in some, you know, like with Fukushima and things like that, right? Like you know that's where there have were kind of two different outcomes based on the two different kinds of reactors, and you can see in there some differences, some inherent differences in kind of mindful organizing, although that was a you know, a multi-dimensional catastrophic situation. Uh, but in terms of like its applicability, I think it would be highly applicable and highly transferable given that there is a more kind of collective orientation with dealing with these kind of conceptual things and keeping more ideas in play and things like that. So there is, I think there's more comfort with some of the dualisms and some of the, the nuance and the paradox. And I think that bit is something that's really, that's actually, I think, uh, you know, from what I understand, my limited perspective in kind of Asian organizations, we would, uh, organizations founded in Asia, um, you know, would be, are doing and just maybe not labeling it that kind of way. So some of it might just be relabeling and repackaging some uh, some existing kind of practice, like even like Toyota production system kind of things are not altogether qualitatively different than mindful organizing. It's just a little bit different emphasis. Maybe a couple little aspects of it are a little bit, uh, you know, um, sharper in one direction or another based on based on how you label it. Um, so, but I think. I think there's ample opportunity to study there. And in terms of the, the macho culture bit, uh, let me make sure that I, I'm getting it right. So what I heard that is, uh, I think one thing that mindful organizing can help do is get people more oriented toward learning. And when you're more oriented toward learning, it un unwinds some of the macho culture bit. The best paper I've seen on that is it's not a mindful organizing paper, or at least they don't call it that. It's, and it's not really a safety culture paper, although it could be. It's uh, Robin Ely and Deb Meyerson have uh, a paper on what they call undoing gender on offshore oil rigs. So it's in, I think it's in Research and Organizational Behavior in 2010, where it's really about unwinding that kind of manly man culture and to get people to open up and be more engaged in learning. And they see, they see some interventions that do that work and the, you know, the performance of the organization improves and also the, you know, the, the quality of the, the interactions on the rig improve also. 
Well, Dr. Bogus, thank you so much for, for all of your insight today. You, again, thinking back at this call, you've shared your expertise, fielded questions from the chat, surfaced some areas for research that might be interesting. There's some research gaps today that we covered, which um, doesn't always happen. So thank you for, for helping illuminate some of those. And then just your advice for, for scholars across different levels of, of their career is really helpful. So. A uh, big hearty thank you. And thank you everybody for joining and participating. Um, these conversations wouldn't be what they are without all the audience participation as well. And Go ahead. I was just gonna say thanks, Sophia. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for all of you for attending uh, and, and spending an hour with us at, at, at midnight, Ken. That's, <laughs> that's, that's some super commitment there, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful.